if others uh, are well and, and joyful and are able to enjoy our worship together with us this morning. Our scripture meditation this morning will come from the book of Ecclesiastes, and it's a passage that was recommended in our Bible reading plan that we handed out last week. I was informed that for many of you, the Bible reading plan was in far too small a print. And for that, I I apologize only partially because it was made to fold neatly and put inside the pages of your Bible. However, I've also duplicated it in a much larger print. Uh, It's not perhaps as large as you'd like, but it is a full-size sheet of paper. It takes two. They're stapled. And I have some of those in the back. If you'd like an electronic copy of that, I'll be sending out our weekly news email this Tuesday, like we typically will. And I'll include a link in that email where you can download a copy so that you can have an electronic copy on your phone or your tablet or your computer or however you like to do that. Maybe even print one out to whatever size your heart might be content with. Um, Um, But it really has been a blessing already in just a couple of days this year, and I trust the Lord will use that to minister to your heart this year as you commit yourself to reading through the Bible, perhaps for the first time, and are able to stay with the rest of us as we read together. On the back table, there you will see the envelopes that are typically used for giving. Thank you uh, for those of you who are here and those of you who are at home who regularly and, and graciously give to our ministry. Over the course of the years, we've used the envelope system in order to allow you to be able to give confidentially, but also to receive a record of your giving. And so it it kind of uncouples your name from the gifts that you give and allows them a way to keep track of those things. But we realize that as we enter a new uh, millennium, uh, really we're into a new millennium with many new ways of giving, that the envelope system isn't the most convenient or, or the most frequently used by many people. And so... I just want to mention a couple of things about that, and that is that if you would like to continue using those envelopes to uh, turn your gift in in person or to mail your gift and include an envelope number, that is perfectly fine. We're not going to take those away from you. All you need to do is go to the table in the back, and you'll find your name on a list. You'll see an envelope box number on that list next to it, and you can take that box of envelopes, and those will be yours. If you have traditionally gotten envelopes and now you find, for instance, that tithely or electronic giving is far more convenient, then you don't need those anymore. And you could go back to the list and just scratch through your name. And that way they would know not to continue to buy a box for you from year to year. And so if you take a look at that list this morning on your way out, or if you're at home and uh, you have some response one way or another, uh, and you want to email the office at office at fbcoflewis.org to let us know whether or not we should uh, mail those boxes to you or, or stop getting them for you, please do let us know, and that would be a big help. Uh, we don't have our teen club tonight, but we will have it on the third Sunday night of the month, which is the 17th. And then tom- tomorrow, <laughs> not tomorrow, next Sunday evening is our annual members meeting that we have at the beginning of every year to review our budget for the year, to review our goals, our plans, to share testimonies about what the Lord has done in the previous year. And I hope that you'll make a point of coming. It'll be next Sunday evening at six o'clock in this room. And we do need a quorum of our church uh, membership to be here in order to make those legitimate votes as we, we do give some direction to the course of our ministry. And so I, I pray that you would see seriously consider attending if at all possible and certainly if you're a member this is also something that's open to folks who are regular attenders and care about our church but are not members it's just that they wouldn't have the privilege of voting at that meeting next sunday night Uh, One final announcement that I have this morning, and that's that this is uh, Sebastian Terman's last Sunday with us before he goes off to college, Lord willing. He's been a wonderful asset and helped our ministry over the course of several months as an intern. And uh, I'm sure that after the service is over, uh, you know, he he would love to make himself available to you for, you know, any any word of gratitude that you have for him. Maybe I'll I'll insist that he post himself at the back door or something so that you can wish him well. I know you'll pray for him while he's at school and other students will be leaving here in days to come and we'll pray for them as well well. But let's turn our attention now to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 through 8 as we consider a new year and the time that the Lord will have appointed from eternity past for us this year. Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verses 1 through 8. To everything there is a season. There is a time to every purpose under the heaven. There's a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal, a time to break down and a time to build up. There's a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance. 
There's a time to cast away stones and a time to gather stones together, a time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing. There's a time to get and a time to lose, a time to keep and a time to cast away, a time to rend and a time to sow, a time to keep silence and a time to speak. There's a time to love and a time to hate, a time of war and a time of peace. Whatever time the Lord brings us into in the coming year, I pray and trust that in that time you will find Him at work continually in your life to draw your attention to His goodness and His grace and to make you more like Jesus. Let's stand together and we'll sing a hymn. We'll sing, O Church, Arise and Put Your Armor On for That Battle. Church, arise and put your armor on. Hear the call of Christ our captain. For now the weak can say that they are strong in the strength that God has given. With shield of faith and belt of truth, we'll stand against the devil's lies. Army bold, whose battle cry is love, reaching out to those in darkness. Come see the cross where love and mercy meet, as the Son of God is stricken. Then see his foes like thrush beneath his feet, for the conqueror has risen. And as the stone is rolled away, and Christ emerges from the grave, His victory march continues till the day, every eye and heart shall see Him. Remain standing and turn the page. If you picked up a worship guide, we'll sing Wonderful, Merciful Savior. standing as we go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Fathers, we come before you. We recognize that there is a longing in the heart of people. As one previously said, there is a God-shaped hole 
in our souls that only you can properly fill. And Lord, we praise you for the things you bring into our lives that cause us to feel that whole. Though we may look at them as tragedies, as difficulties, as painful experiences, as hurts and as wants, we recognize that they point to something that we need that we cannot ourselves fill. They point to the fact that we as sinful beings living in a fallen and cursed world are so far from the great and wonderful original creation that many of us read about this week in the beginning of the book of Genesis. We recognize that it is sin that entered into the world and brought this death, this physical, spiritual, and emotional death that we experience. And yet in this, we rejoice to know that you have sent your Son to be the seed of the woman who would crush the head of this serpent that's made himself so odious to humanity, this serpent that is representative of Satan, our adversary, and the evil that he brings into the world. Father, we rejoice to know that he and his power will one day be completely crushed and that it was for him that you created the lake of fire. While we, we groan, to consider anyone being cast into the lake of fire because their name was not found written in the book of life. We also, those of us who know Christ, rejoice in that there is such a thing because it is only knowing that there is that ultimate destruction laying in wait for sin and for evil that we can look forward to a time when we don't have to experience it, where we can be ourselves delivered completely from the evil nature the evil desires, the things that we fight against daily. Lord, one day be made entirely like Jesus. Father, we rejoice to think about that day and pray that you would begin that work in our hearts today. Now that that our lives might before you shine forth like light in the world. That we might be the salt and the light that your spirit intends us to be and we might enjoy the fellowship with you that you intend for us to have, Lord. We come before you this morning confessing that we have not done that as we ought, but confidently confessing, knowing that if we confess these are sins, that you will be faithful and just to forgive us of these sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Father, it's in that name of Jesus that we come before you this morning and make requests. We thank you for the gifts that you've given us. As we pray this morning for one faithful family that you have given us to support, the Caputo family, I thank you for their work over at Millersville University among the young population of students there and pray that you would make them successful in sharing your glory through the gospel. We thank you particularly for the wives of these ministers that you've given us this morning. Thank you for Kim and her faithfulness to her husband there, her support of her ministry. Thank you for the ministry wives you've given us in our own church. Thank you for Deb and for Leslie and for the wives of our deacons, our trustees, our teachers, and our our many servants. We thank you for these ladies who you've given us to be a helper and to support, to teach, and to serve. I pray that they would find they would find the, the grace and energy they need to continue doing that work in the Spirit, knowing that their treasure is laid up in heaven. Father, we thank you for the privilege that we have of studying your word in a few moments. And I pray that you be with Pastor Monroe this morning as he preaches your word to us, that he'd be faithful to communicate clearly what the word says, that your spirit would be present among us, that he might drive the meaning deep into our hearts, that we might truly meet with you and become like you as a result. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. And I'll invite you to turn in your Bibles to Luke chapter 4. Pastor Monroe, as I mentioned, is going to be bringing the word to us this morning. And he'll come and read the scripture for us this morning from Luke chapter 4. We're going to be reading this morning Luke 4, beginning at verse 16, and we'll read through verse 30. Jesus came to his hometown as a as the Son of God, announcing to these people that he was going to have a ministry that was both unique and powerful, and so that's what the text is about today. We're going to be focusing in the message on verse 16, so you can know that in advance. Beginning at verse 18, rather, beginning at verse 16. And he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for to read. And there was delivered unto him 
the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he hath anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and recovering of the sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised, to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, and he gave it to the minister, and sat down. And the eyes of all them that were in the synagogue were fastened up on him. And he began to say unto them, This day is this scripture fulfilled in your ears. And all bear witness, and all bear him witness, and wondered at the gracious words which proceeded out of his mouth. And they said, Is not this Joseph's son? And he said unto them, Ye will surely say unto me this proverb, Physician, heal thyself. Whatsoever we have heard done in Capernaum, do he also here in thy country. And he said, Verily I say unto you, no prophet is accepted in his own country. But I tell you of a truth. Many widows were in Israel in the days of Elias, when the heavens were shut up three years and six months, when great famine was throughout the land. But unto none of them was Elias sent, save unto Sephtah, a city of Sidon, unto a woman that was a widow. And many lepers were in Israel in the time of Eliseus, the prophet, and none of them was cleansed, saving Naaman the Syrian. Now all they in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath, and rose up and thrust him out of the city, and led him to the brow of the city, a brow of the hill whereupon the city was built, that they might cast him down headlong. And he passed through the midst of them when went his way. God bless his word. You may remain seated and we'll turn again and sing, My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed, but in the blood of Christ. Remain seated, please. My faith has found a resting place, not in device nor creed. I trust the ever-living one, his wounds for me. and will sing all the way my Savior leads me just the first stanza. Missed to Children's Church. (laughs) 
What wondrous love is this, O my soul, O my soul? What wondrous love is this, O my soul? What wondrous love is this that caused the Lord of bliss to bear the dreadful curse? For my soul, for my soul, to bear the dreadful curse for my soul. When I was sinking down, sinking down, sinking down, when I was sinking down, sinking down when I was sinking down beneath God's righteous frown Christ laid aside his crown for my soul for my soul for Christ laid down his crown for my soul to God and to the Lamb I will sing I will sing to God and to the Lamb I will sing to God and to the Lamb who is the great I am while millions join the theme Join the theme, join the theme, while billions join the theme. I will sing. Thank you, Brother Lee. If you've got your Bibles, please turn them to Luke chapter 4. When we made the transition in our leadership, one of the things that we planned to do from the very beginning was to have an opportunity to raise up a group of people within our church who would be able to help people when they're struggling with personal issues through a means of biblical counseling. It used to be, years ago, that all counseling in our society was done by pastors, and society has drifted away from that when there were uh, the arising of professional counselors, psychologists, and so on. However, in many cases, secular psychology is not even close to biblical counseling. God's Word offers the answers to life. And when Jesus came to his hometown, he came and uh, delivered this very simple message of his purpose, which is found in verse 16. When he, verse 18, I keep confusing that. We're in verse 18 is where I'd like you to look. And so Jesus said, the Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he hath anointed me. In other words, God has equipped Jesus, though Jesus himself was God. Jesus came to earth with the proper equipment to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, and the recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty them that are bruised. When Jesus read this, this is a, almost a direct quote from Isaiah chapter 62. And he stopped here where it says he has preached to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. And the reason for that was that Jesus came at this time to offer graciously to the world the opportunity for them to have forgiveness and to be cleansed from their sins and to be washed and to have newness of life in Christ. The next phrase in this verse, if he would have continued in Isaiah 62, is this, and the day of vengeance of our God. Jesus came in his first coming to offer salvation and forgiveness. He will come again as a judge, and we will be accountable for all that we have done and how we have lived and the time we have used our lives and how we have used our lives in that period of time. Jesus will be judge, but right now he offers himself to us as Savior. And so when he came to his hometown, he came particularly with the wonderful idea that he would make it possible for people to find saving faith in Christ and to come to know him personally and to have a transforming effect upon their lives. Now, the Bible has the idea 
and throughout the idea is that the gospel is the remedy to the problems and sorrows of life. The Bible isn't just a good idea to read. It's not just partially beneficial. It's life transforming. And God's word in your life will transform your life if you allow that to take place. When this event occurred, Jesus had already been around Israel selecting disciples. He had already performed many miracles in other places because they said, the miracles you've done in other places, do some of those here. But he never did any of them here because the prophet was not accepted in his own land. Jesus had already turned the water to wine. He had met with Nicodemus. He had had a discussion with the woman at the well in John chapter 4. John the Baptist was already in prison. So there was a lot of things that had already taken place in the life of Christ up to this point. And now he comes to his own hometown and he tells the people, I'm the Messiah. I'm offering forgiveness to the world. But he said, you won't accept it. And they didn't. His custom was to go to the synagogue. Jesus wasn't at the synagogue once in a while. He was always at the synagogue as a young man. He's about 30 years old at this point in his life. And when he comes to the synagogue, he read from the scriptures. And this was something that was customary. I don't think this is the first time Jesus ever spoke in the synagogue. Now, in Israel, remember that there was one temple in Jerusalem. But there were many synagogues, like there are today many churches, local churches. Well, the synagogues were somewhat similar to that in that there were local areas where people met for worship, and then periodically they were required to go to the temple and to worship at the temple and to do sacrifice at the temple. But Jesus, as he did every Sabbath, sat down and preached the word and met with fellow believers in the synagogue. Now, the response to this message was not favorable. If you look toward the end of this passage in verse 28, it says, When they heard what he said... They were filled with wrath. Well, why, why were they so angry at this message? Uh, sometimes people respond wrongly to the truth of God's word, and these people certainly did. But what had happened, he told them that there was a great famine in Israel, and there was only one person, only one widow who was spared, and that was a woman who was a Sidonian. She wasn't even an Israelite. So he was saying God's blessing was upon someone outside of Israel, not in Israel. And then he said when Elisha was, was present, there, was, there were many uh, lepers in Israel, but only one was healed, and that was Naaman, who was outside of Israel. And they were very angry because why would God do something like that in um, outside lands of Israel? Why wouldn't he do it in Israel? When Jesus highlighted those two examples, they were angry because he did not nationalize his ministry. This was supposed to be a Jewish ministry. The Messiah was to rescue Israel. The Messiah was not to rescue the world. But Jesus, in essence, was saying there is going to be a greater ministry among Gentiles than there is going to be among the Jews. And that's certainly been true over the centuries. There has been thousands, millions more Gentiles come to Christ than Jews over the years. So the early ministry of Christ was um, mostly involved with the Jewish population. The first early convert, converts were, were uh, Jewish. But the passage makes clear that when Jesus Christ came, comes to save a soul, his intention is not just to take a person to heaven, but to transform the life of that person. When God saved you, if you've come to know Christ as your personal Savior, God didn't save you just so you could go to heaven. If that were the case, then the moment you became a Christian, God could just take you to heaven if that's all he had purpose for you to do. But he has the intention to change you. And that's where our wills come into play. Sometimes we don't allow God to do the changing in our lives that he wants to do. But God definitely wants to change us. Look at this thought here as we consider this truth. There is no sinful act or desire or practice that cannot be conquered and overcome through the power of the gospel of Jesus Christ and the enablement of the Holy Spirit. There is nothing in your life that is awry that God cannot make right. Think about that. A lot of times people will have the idea, well, I have a problem that's uncurable or unconquerable. I can't change it. I just the way I am. And the fact is that is just not so. Sometimes we have a sentence in a sermon and here's here's what the sentence in a sermon would be. Christians must allow the gospel of Jesus Christ to completely transform them. Their mind, their heart, their actions and not simply be content that they would go to heaven. The church and Christians exist to carry out the fulfillment of the five clear purposes that Jesus makes clear in this passage of Scripture. And so let's look at them. They're in your notes if you want to follow along. The first thing was to preach the gospel to the poor. 
Gospel here is the idea of good news or to announce glad tidings. Well, what happier tidings could we bring than that there is a Savior in the world who is willing to save us from our sins? What greater news could we offer to someone in the world than that great news? God will forgive them through Christ if they are willing to trust him as their Savior. The gospel is used in the Old Testament and then in the New Testament of good news, of joyful tidings, of in particular messianic blessings. Now note what Jesus says here, that uh, he's preaching the gospel to the poor. Now does that mean that we never t talk to rich people about the gospel? No, that's not what it's talking about. It's not talking about rich and poor and money or economically. It's talking about rich or poor in the sense of spirituality. He's talking about people who were poor spiritually. You remember the first of the Beatitudes was this. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Well, what did he mean, the poor in spirit? Well, if you were poor in money, it means that you don't have enough money or enough economic resources to cover your bills. If you're in poor health, you're sickly, you need to go to the doctor. If you're poor in eyesight, you need to go to the doctor and get glasses or contacts to improve your eyesight. What God is saying here is somebody who is spiritually poor is spiritually needy. Who are the spiritually needy? Everybody. Everybody is the spiritually needy. It's just many times people don't recognize themselves as having a spiritual need. The first church I was at, we had a little girl come to our youth program. That was a child's program. And uh, as we were teaching one day, we taught that all of us are sinners. And so we asked that this little girl wanted to talk afterward. And we said, are you, are you a sinner? Have you ever sinned? She said, no. I said, have you ever told a lie? She said, no. I knew that was a lie. Uh, she said, I said, have you ever disobeyed your parents? She said, no, we knew that was a lie. And the fact is that many people are just like that little girl. They just will not admit that they have sinned against God. The needy person is the person who recognizes that, that problem. It was the um, prodigal son who went away thinking that money was going to be the answer to all of his problems. He's going to go out. He was going to enjoy himself and all the wickedness of the world. He's going to take all that inheritance. He was going to spend it. He was going to have a great time. And that was going to just fulfill him to no end. And he was going to be so happy. Well, a few months later, he finds himself as a Jewish boy in a hog pen. Now, I don't know whether you've ever been in a hog pen. Um, I had some friends on a farm who took me to their hog pen. You don't want to be in one, let me assure you. It's not like the grassy slopes where cows are grazing out in the pasture. It's a terrible, we'll just stop there. It's a terrible place. And the fact is, here's this Jewish boy feeding husks of corn that he himself was wanting to eat, though he couldn't really eat this, and feeding it to the pigs. And there in that hog pen, he realized, I have a spiritual need. I am better off with my father than I am here. I'm better off without the money, but back with my father. You see, many people don't recognize their spiritual need, and so they never take action to solve their spiritual problem. Do you have a spiritual need? Are you poor spiritually? Have you found forgiveness in Christ alone, who only can give you forgiveness? The poor in spirit are actually spiritually needy and without spiritual hope. They're people who are lost. They're people who are not headed for heaven. They've not found God's forgiveness. There are many religious people who are lost. There are many morally good people who are lost. There are many people who are living a wicked life. They're lost as well. But no matter what scale of goodness you attribute to yourself, all of us are spiritually needy and desperately need Christ as our personal Savior. The greatest need that you have in this life is of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. That's the greatest need you have. You don't have a greater need than that. You know, an addict will think that his greatest need is his next fix. Uh, a person in some deep sin will think the next thing will be the participation in that sin. The greatest need you have is Christ. He is the one who can give you the answer to your problems, the solution to your need. Everyone makes a decision in life either to receive Jesus Christ as their Savior or to reject him. The greatest decision we have when we come to this point of spiritual need is, will we receive or will we reject Christ? What will we do with him? 
Everybody stands at the, at the fulcrum of that. You either receive or reject Christ. You don't almost receive him. You don't almost reject him. You either are in the process of rejecting him or in the process you have received him and you possess him. It's like, um, are you married? Well, you could be engaged and tomorrow could be your wedding day, but you'd say, no, I'm not married. But one day afterward, you say, yes, I am. You know, you're either married or not. You're not almost married. You're not almost not married. You either are or aren't. You either are a Christian or you aren't. It's not almost. It's either you are or aren't. The second thing we consider is what Jesus says in verse 18. He hath sent me to heal the brokenhearted. All of us have seen people who have been brokenhearted. And some of you have had a time in your life where you have been brokenhearted. Something has stabbed you in the heart emotionally, physically, not physically, or you wouldn't be dead, you wouldn't be alive, but certainly emotionally you've been, you've been heartbroken. Something has hit you so hard that you are heartbroken. Some of those who've experienced harsh treatment in life from others, you've been hurt by people you've loved, people you've trusted. You've suffered great loss and you've been heartbroken. Now, Jesus didn't come and say, okay, you'll forget about all that. I'm going to make you forget about all that because... Honestly, you can't just erase things that are in your mind that you know, deep hurts that you've had in your life. But Christ can heal the brokenhearted. He can settle that issue in your life so that it is resolved. To heal here is to make completely whole. It's to cure. The sorrow is not forgotten or ignored. Time didn't take it away. But God healed your soul. You know, the wonderful thing about being a Christian is that God gives us a solution to the troubles that we experience in life. God doesn't just wipe everything away. Now in the passage it says Jesus healed the brokenhearted. It says he set the captives free. He heals the blind. Now it doesn't mean that every physically blind person will be made able to see. But it does mean that every spiritually blind person will be able to see. And that every person who is spiritually broken can be restored. And God can do a transforming work in your life to make that possible. The third thing we want to see this morning, by the way, if you're following in your notes, this somehow got omitted from the notes, but preach deliverance to the captives. This is a very interesting word. The word captive here literally means to be taken by a spear. How much more vivid picture could there be than you're walking through the forest and uh, some natives come up, they all have spears, and you're taken captive with the spear. You don't have a choice. You don't have an option. You are a captive. What God is saying here is that there are people in life who have been made captive by sin. They have been taken over by some sin in their life, and they're held as captives. Satan has made millions of captives to sinful habits, lustful passions, pride, and without Christ, they have no ability to find freedom. Let me share a couple of verses with you from the New Testament. 2 Timothy chapter 2 and verse 24 gives wise counsel about this point. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient. In meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. What better description could there be of someone who takes drugs into their body and is incapacitated, takes alcohol into their body and is drunk, um, has a, a passion that destroys them? They're destroying themselves. They oppose themselves by the sins that they allow in their life. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. God brings repentance into the life of a needy sinner, making that sinner sorry for his sins, willing to turn from them, and then place their faith in Christ. Christ comes into their life to transform them by his power. Verse 26 in that passage says, And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil, who are taken captive by him at his will. Some people may say, I can quit this bad habit whenever I want. When I was young, I made the foolish decision to smoke as a young teenager. And I often told myself, I can stop any time I wanted. Well, I could stop for two or three days, and then I said, well, I'll reward myself and I'll smoke again. And it didn't, it, that cycle kept going over and over again in my life. And finally, I went to a Christian college and you weren't allowed to smoke there and it was easy to quit. <laughs> but the fact was that I made many attempts and I, I didn't. I didn't get successful at that because that thing had taken me captive. It had made me its captive. 
God enables those who fully surrender to him and to the control of the Holy Spirit to find power to conquer sinful habits, sinful desires, and temptations. God gives the power to do that. You know, a lot of times in talking with people, they'll have a sinful habit. And if, if you have something you're struggling with, if you'll just take this simple formula, when you're struggling with something, at the moment of temptation, you make a choice, either to say, yes, I will give in to that, or no, I won't. If at that point you say, I will surrender to Christ, I will surrender to him, you will find victory. God will give you victory. But you continually surrender to Christ at that point of temptation. You don't surrender to your flesh and the desires of the flesh and the evil that you would like to do in your body, but you surrender to Christ. I will do what you want me to do, Lord. Just help me to do what would be pleasing to you. Many people enter into a sinful action with the hope that it will bring peace or satisfaction and happiness, when in the end it takes them a captive and makes them a slave. They're taken by the spear. Drug use, a sinful relationship, an extramarital affair, the key to... So, uh, to, the key to successful release from those sins that take us captive is to yield fully to the control of the Holy Spirit. Modern secular advice doesn't have the answer to this, but God's Word does. God's Word has the truth to help us deal with those issues so that they can be resolved. Turn with me, in you, if you would, to uh, Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. Romans chapter 6 and verse 12. Verse 13 is especially a valuable verse when it comes to the idea of uh, having victory over a sinful habit. What do you do? Well, verse 12 makes the command. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your mortal body. So there's the command. Do not allow something sinful to be in control of you, whether it's anger, pride, lust, whatever the issue is. Do not allow that to control you, that ye should obey it in the lust thereof. Verse 13 reveals the plan. Well, how do you do that? If the command is don't do this, well, how do you not do that? Verse 13, neither yield ye your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin. Don't allow those eyes to see something you shouldn't see. Don't allow those fingers to click on something on your computer that you ought not to look at. Don't allow those ears to hear something you shouldn't hear. Don't allow those feet to take you somewhere where you shouldn't go. Neither yield you your members as instruments of unrighteousness unto sin, but yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead, and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God. The result for sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under the law, but under grace. So verse 13 just simply says, you will yield to something. Whatever you yield to, you will become that servant. You'll become a servant of that thing. If you yield continually to a desire of your body, you're going to become a slave to that desire anything from eating to lust. You become a slave of that desire. If you yield to God, you become a willing slave to God, and you conquer those evils that are to control you. Through Jesus Christ, though Jesus Christ is willing and able to save your soul, and he is willing and able to give you a transformed and trained life and a useful servant of, as a useful servant of God, you must ask yourself this, well, how does God expect the gospel to work in my life? How am I supposed to have victory in this area of my life where I have been weak? Romans 6, 12 to 14, surrender to God. Be his servant, and you will joyfully be his servant. You know, over the years I've met many people who in their later years have said, well, I wish when I was younger I would have lived for Christ. And it's too late then. I wish five years ago I would have decided to live for Christ like I am now. You can't get those years back, but you can today say, I am going to, by God's grace, surrender to him at every opportunity and obey Christ at every opportunity. And I will be that servant that God wants me to be. I believe it was D.L. Moody who said, the world has not known a man who is full, who, the world has not yet known a man who is fully surrendered to Christ. I plan to be that man. And God wonderfully used him in many ways. It's not uncommon among Christians, even among those without Christ, to have a problem that they don't know what to do as far as how to solve it. That's why biblical, biblical counseling is so valuable. One Christian with more experience and more Bible knowledge sharing that with somebody else and how they can find victory, how they can find help. 
through principles of the scripture that are timeless and powerful. Proverbs 11 and verse 14 says, Where there is no counsel, the people fall. But in the multitude of counselors, there is safety. This is precisely one of the reasons why we want to develop a biblical counseling ministry at First Baptist Church, to provide our members and uh, friends with an opportunity to learn the Bible and learn how to help other people through their struggles. Now, we have a course that we're offering. There's a sign-up at the back of the auditorium today. If you're listening online and would like to sign up, we don't have a definite date to begin the course yet, but we will in time. But we'd like you to sign up or let us know that you have some interest in participating. Taking this course does not mean that you will be a professional licensed counselor. Taking this course will mean that you have a heads up on being able to help people, help people learn how to deal with the struggles that they have. But it also does a second thing. And that second thing, it helps you to learn how to deal with you. No counselor can help somebody else until they help themselves. You know, you really can't teach someone how to swim until you know how to swim. You can't really teach someone how to live unless you know how to live. And so that's what the course is about. We'd love for you to be a part of that. It's, uh, so please take advantage of signing up and we will let you know. Is all Bible counseling successful? A man came to Jesus one time and said, Good master, how can I gain eternal life? And Jesus said, well, you know the commandments. Do you keep them? He said, yes, I've, I've kept them all, every one of them. So Jesus tested him at the area of his greatest love. And Jesus said, here's what you do. Go sell everything that you have and come and follow me. And the man went away sorrowful because he was very wealthy and had a great many possessions. And he just couldn't give them up. I just couldn't do it. You see, Jesus asked discipleship to make the greatest change in his life where that man had the most error in his love relationship, and that was he loved things more than he loved God. And he wasn't willing to give up the things for God. Does God ask every person who has wealth to give up everything they have to follow God? No, but he does ask you to make him first place in your life. He doesn't allow for any discrepancy in that. Christ must be first place if you're going to follow him effectively. For example, many people pursue something that they hope will satisfy them. We illustrated earlier from the prodigal son who thought that if he got money and possessions and all this attention from friends and could do anything he wants, that he would be happy. But many people think that these sinful things will bring about great happiness. And in the end, it brings about great ruin. Anything that you have to pursue with the intention that it will make you happy and leave God out will be the very thing that destroys you. Let me say that again. Anything that you think will bring you happiness, that you pursue with all your might and you leave God out, that will be the very thing that will destroy you. How many people thought, well, a little drink won't hurt me, and next thing you know, after many years, they get under some crisis and they turn to alcoholism, and it destroys them. What they thought would make them happy destroyed them. A lustful relationship, what they thought would make them happy, destroyed them. The same thing is true with almost anything. God will give you grace to endure every, any, every trial that you have. The sin, in your, the sin that you have is not in your willpower to control, but it is in God's power to deliver you from it, if you will allow him. When you submit to God, he gives you power to resist. The more you submit, the more power he gives you to resist. The more times you submit to him, the more power he gives you to resist and conquer that thing that has been such a troublesome thing in your life. The fourth thing we're going to consider is recovering the sight to the blind. Physical blindness is a severe handicap. When I was in college, there was a guy I knew quite well who was blind, and he, he navigated life very well, considering. But it's a severe handicap. And any of us who are seeing, if we had to be blind all of a sudden, would find it to be a terribly difficult handicap to adjust to. Spiritual blindness happens when people believe the lies of Satan over the truths of God's word. Whether they see it or not, they believe Satan's lies, and in accepting his lies, they think, oh, I've found the truth. And in f believing those lies and acting on them, they follow a life and a lifestyle that leads them far away from God. Many are blind to the truths of God and suffer through life believing a lie and living under the control of a lie. Satan's greatest tool 
to ruin the world and to ruin the people in the world is to tell lies that people believe. Um, I did a little search on the internet and just looking up lies that people believe. And they had a hundred. They're probably more than that. I'm not going to read them all to you, so I don't want you to be nervous. But let me just share a few with you. There are many people who say there's no evidence of God. When you look at the marvel of nature and the intricacies of nature and the complexity of the human body, that didn't just happen by accident. People say truth is relative. In other words, it's whatever you believe it is. Well, if you can believe that there's a Mack truck coming and it won't hurt you if it runs over you, mister, you're believing a lie, and you're in big trouble. Unborn babies are not fully human. That's what people are believing. So it's okay to just discard them like trash. Um, God will let all good people go to heaven. There are no people who are perfectly good. We're all sinners in need of a Savior. So that's false. Drunkenness is a sickness. It's a self-inflicted problem. It's not a sickness. There are many paths to heaven. There are millions of people who believe that just find a path to heaven, whatever way you choose is good, it'll get you there. That's a false and that's a lie. Science is the greatest truth. Humans evolved from apes. I was reading a story a little while ago about this uh, boy who came to his dad and said, Dad, how did we get here? And the dad needed a little long explanation of how we get here. And uh, he said, well, Mom says we came from apes. He said, well, that's her side of the family, not, not my side of the family. Some people believe that hell is not real. Well, the devil would love for us to believe that. He would love for us to think that's true, so we wouldn't worry about that. We wouldn't be concerned about it. We wouldn't take any caution about not going there. If hell is not real, live how you want. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow we die, and it doesn't matter. Now, the lie is money makes us happy and satisfies us. Another lie is, I am in control of my destiny. All of those things are false. Understand this truth. I, I kind of referred to this earlier, but let me just refer to this very clearly again. If you're in a wicked, sinful lifestyle, you are not there because God created you that way, but because that is how sin has corrupted you. There are many people in our world today who are in a sinful lifestyle, and they're saying that God made me this way, this is just the way I am, so this is the way I have to live. Your lifestyle does not indicate the way God made you. It indicates how sin has corrupted you. That's a powerful truth. You are at fault, in other words, for your sinful choices and your sinful lifestyle, not God. You are responsible. You have made choices, and those choices have led you to be where you are. You think everyone in this auditorium this morning, everyone listening over the Internet today, you are where you are right now because of the choices you've made, bad or good. You are where you are because of the choices you've made. Now, some things have happened in your life that you had no control of. I'm not talking about those. Those are different issues. But by and large, most of us are where we are today because of the choices we've made. Some of the things are because of the environment we were born into that we couldn't control. That those would be factors as well. But many times it's because of who we are. So why is biblical counseling necessary? To help us to understand the lies we believed and to believe truth. To replace those lies with the truths that are found in God's word. Listen to what the Bible says. 2 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16. All scripture, so all of the Bible, is given by inspiration of God. So it's all God-breathed. And it's all profitable. And God gave it for four reasons. Number one, he gave it for doctrine. In other words, for us to know what is right. He gave it to us for reproof, to show us where we are wrong. He gave it to us for correction, to show us how to correct our wrongs. And he gave us for instruction in righteousness, everything else we need to know about righteousness. So when we hear a lie, however, we need to compare it with God's word, the truth. What does the truth say about the lie? We believe the truth, we discard the lie. Here's what happens oftentimes, maybe you've heard this little scenario, but oftentimes there are lies that are floated out in our society. And if you're a little older, you can look in your lifetime and you can see that there are lies that people believe now that they didn't believe 25 years ago. And here's how it happens. First, we overlook evil. Well, they can do it if they want. Then we permit evil. Okay, it's okay with me. Then we legalize evil. Then we promote evil. 
Then we celebrate evil. Can you see that in society? Then we persecute those who call it evil. That's the direction we're going. And that's the direction when people believe a lie, and that lie is perpetuated over and over and over again. And there's an old study Bible. It's called the Dakes Annotated Bible. And uh, it says this about the Bible. I've seen this a number of times, but this is a wonderful little quote. It says, the Bible contains the mind of God, the state of man, the way of salvation, the doom of sinners, the happiness of believers. Its doctrines are holy, its precepts are binding, its histories are true, its decisions are immutable. Read it to be wise, believe it to be safe, and practice it to be holy. It contains light to direct you, food to support you, and comfort to cheer you. It is the traveler's map, the pilgrim's staff, the pilot's compass, the soldier's sword, and the Christian's charter. Here paradise is restored, heaven is opened, and the gates of hell disclosed. Christ is its grand subject, and our good the design, and the glory of God its end. It should fill the memory, rule the heart, guide the feet, read it slowly, frequently, and prayerfully. It is a mine of wealth, a paradise of glory, and a river of pleasure. It is given you in life that will be opened at the judgment and remembered forever. It involves the highest responsibility, will reward the greatest labor, and will condemn all those who trifle with its contents. When we look at the Bible, the Bible is God's word. It is the answer to life. The struggles that you're having right now are in some measure because you are not living in accord with the scripture. The troubles that you're experiencing are because maybe you don't know the scripture. Maybe what you know you're not applying, but the answers are here. The more we know God's word, the wiser we will be. That's why God said, meditate on his word day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written for therein, for then you will make your way prosperous, and then you will have great success. Get into God's word. God's word is truth for eternity and for life. Biblical wisdom is intended to enable Christians to think right so they can act obediently and they can live victoriously. Last and briefly, uh, we'll look at, uh, we already talked about that. Last and briefly, to set at liberty them that are bruised. Bruised here has the idea of not being hit in the face and you develop a black eye, but it has the idea of being oppressed. Early on in Christianity, most of the Christians were persecuted and oppressed by unbelievers. Um, communism has persecuted and oppressed millions of Christians. Islam is currently persecuting Christians in Asia, Africa, and the Middle East. So when they tell you that Islam is a peaceful religion, don't you believe it? Where they have freedom to do what they want, they are persecuting Christians around the world. Many people have been handicapped in life because of one of these several things. One, they, something bad or disappointing happened to them, and they responded negatively. Someone hurt them or abused them, or they experienced a great loss, and they lived in those tragedies for years. And those tragedies molded their life rather than finding the victory that Christ can give through his word. Why do so many Christians need help but ignore it in the area of finding somebody who can give them counsel that will help? I think oftentimes our pride gets in the way. We don't want someone to know that we're having a problem. <laughs> we want everybody to think that we're a perfect Christian, that nothing ever goes wrong, that I don't have any problems, that nothing is ever out of order in my life. Everything's perfect. I don't need anything. That's not so. If, and probably men are worse at this, if we were to open up our hearts and share some of the real struggles that we have, we all have something. We all have something that we're struggling with. It's just that we don't want to admit it. Our pride says, no, don't tell anybody. They might think that you're uh, related to Jack the Ripper or something. You tell them that. You know, well, the fact is that we all have something, some issue that we're struggling with. Ladies share these better with each other. Men kind of keep all that under wraps because we want everybody to think we're perfect. We want all of our friends to think we're perfect Christians. We do not want to recognize or have to deal with a problem. So if we just don't recognize it, we won't have to deal with it, so we just shun it, just put it aside. We don't want to deal with the problem or make the change that's going to be required if we deal with that problem. 
You know, when, when we deal with issues in our lives and we solve something, we take a step forward and grow. That's what God wants us to do. God wants us to change. He didn't save you because you were perfect. If you're a Christian, if you've come to know the Lord Jesus as your Savior by repenting and placing your faith in Christ, God didn't save you because you were perfect. He saved you because you were a needy sinner and needed to change. There are things in your life that you need to change, things in my life that I need to change. And so God saved you to change you. So when people come to our church, they should see a place and a people where spiritually needy people are finding forgiveness through Christ. They're finding purpose in Christ. They're being able to be serving and being used of God as servants of his. They're being restored from brokenheartedness. They're being set free from the sins who bound them. They're finding the lies that they have believed are being put out of their mind and put out of their heart. And they're believing the truth and they're growing and making steps of advancement in their life. You know, we're just a group of earnest Christians who want to help other people become what God wants them to be. We're not a group of perfect people. We're a group of people who are growing and making progress, who are seeking to be what God wants us to be, but we haven't arrived yet. Every Christian is to have a ministry with other Christians helping them. Who's helping you? Who are you helping? How have you found freedom in Christ, or have you found it? What broken heart have you found to be healed in your life? What person who has a broken heart have you helped them to find healing? We must engage others in life-changing spiritual conversations. And this is not optional for Christians. This is a must. Setting the captives free is what God intends to do. Allowing us to be what God wants us to be is what his intention is. Dr. J. Adams is what, uh, 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 he was a uh, he was a pastor for many years in Philadelphia, and he began to counsel people and found out that he uh, didn't have all the answers. So he began to research and write books and found out that there wasn't very much at all in Christian counseling. So he began to develop uh, this ministry, and he's kind of gently and kindly referred to as the father of modern neuthetic or biblical counseling. And he wrote this, every quality that God requires in his redeemed children can be attained. Every resource that is needed, God has already supplied. Now, you can't go on the excuse as, well, I can't do that. Many Christians say, well, I can't ever talk about Jesus to someone else. Yes, you can. You know, you can talk about it. If God sets your heart on fire, you won't be able to keep quiet. You, you can talk about it. You can share with others if you're willing. If you're willing to be trained by God, something you're excited about, you can get you can be willing and be excited about it enough to tell somebody else. That's God's plan for us to share with others the truth. So let me ask you a couple questions as we close this morning. Number one, can you point to a time in your life when you recognized you had a spiritual need and you found and received God's forgiveness for all the sins in your life? When was the time that that happened to you? Every year you celebrate your birthday, some of you are getting to the point where you're reluctantly celebrating your birthdays, but you are celebrating birthday every year. Don't you remember? That was the day you were born. So when were you born again? When was the day you found forgiveness? When was the time you found forgiveness? What were the events that led up in your life to the point where you found forgiveness? Do you know that you've been saved from your sins through Christ alone? What victories can you point to in life? What can you look back on and say, God delivered me from that problem and that one and that one. God saved me from that. God delivered me from that powerful addiction that I had, that life-controlling sin that I had in my life. God delivered me from that. What has God done in your life? So since he has saved you, what changes have been in your life? It's the wonderful truth of being a Christian is not just coming to Christ. That's the start. If you had a little baby and it was just born, and it stayed that eight pounds, seven ounces for the next 20 years, you'd be a little disappointed. Don't you think God's disappointed that a person becomes a Christian and he stays a baby Christian all his life and never makes progress? I trust God will help you too. Let's bow for prayer as we close. While our heads are bowed, let me just ask you a couple of questions privately while you can think. 
When was the time that you came to know Christ's forgiveness in your life and came to know the Lord Jesus as your personal Savior? Can you point to that time when you realized you were spiritually needy and you put your faith in Christ? Perhaps you'd say, preacher, I've never done that, but I'm concerned about my soul. Would you pray for me? Would you remember to pray for me today? I'm not certain that there's been a time in my life when I put my faith in Christ. Would you pray for me? Next question. Are you making progress in your life? Are you making decisions that are bringing about spiritual victory? Perhaps you'd say, would you pray for me? God spoke to my heart today about some area of my life where I need to make improvement or change. Would you pray for me? God touched my heart to make sure that there's something in my life that needs to be changed. Would you pray for me? Lord, we bow before you with thanksgiving. We praise you for your goodness and mercy. We thank you for the wonderful tool of your word that makes us wise to know how to deal with the areas in our lives where we're struggling and the areas in our lives where we need victory. So we commit ourselves to you. We ask you to make us those kind of servants you would have us to be. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. first Lord's Day of the month when we all celebrate the Lord's table together. If you didn't get one of the elements on your way in, uh, you can lift your hand and I'm sure one of the ushers would be happy to bring you a cup and it has a, uh, a kind of a self-packaged uh, piece of, of the bread as well. And as we go to this point in our service, I just want to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 12, something that we frequently read whenever we take the Lord's table. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Corinthian church about their own celebration of the Lord's table, and he said this, he said, I've received of the Lord that which I also delivered unto you, that the Lord Jesus, the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it, and he said, take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you, this do in remembrance of me. And... Before we have a moment of prayer and then we stand and we sing and we take this element together, I just want to point out that one brief word that it says in here, that phrase, when he had given thanks, the Lord Jesus thanked the Father for the bread that he used to demonstrate that in a few short hours his own body would be broken for you. Normally there's a time that we recommend you spend a moment confessing any sin in your life as we've listened to the message this morning and Pastor Monroe has pointed out that you know, there are many sins in our life that Christ has died for. But this morning, I really think that it would be appropriate for us, as you consider what sins you might need to repent of, to do it in a way that gives thanks. Give thanks for the fact that that forgiveness is yours. Give thanks for the fact that Christ died for you, that you might be able to take this, and, and you yourself remember what he did for you. And so let's have a moment of silent prayer. Leslie will play through one stanza of our, our communion hymn. And then we'll stand, we'll sing a stanza, and we'll take the bread together. stand together and we'll sing that first stanza together. There is a way for sin to be forgiven. There is a way prepared for you and me. There is a way that leads a soul to heaven. That way is Christ, the sinner's perfect Look unto him whose power can cleanse and save your soul. Look unto him whose blood can set you free. 
Look unto him whose sacrifice can make you whole, then you will know the love of Calvary. He'll carefully peel back that top layer and just reveal that bread to you. We'll eat this together, remembering that it is a symbol, Christ said, of his body which is broken for you, and we do this in remembrance of him. Let's sing that second stanza together. There is a love that passes human measure. There is a love that's brighter than the day. There is a love that's richer than all measure. The love of Christ excels in every way. Unto him whose power can cleanse and save your soul. Look unto him whose blood can set you free. Look unto him whose sacrifice can make you whole. Then you will know. After the same manner also he took the cup, and when he had supped, saying, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do ye as often as ye drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as ye eat this bread and drink this cup, you do show the Lord's death till he come. So you can peel back that second layer there carefully. Let's remember the Lord's death. Our Father, we obediently remember your death. You said until you come. You've not come yet, and we know that your delaying is because of your patience, because there are still those that you desire to call to salvation. I pray that there be any in this church, in this community, that you would lead us to them, that we might share your word, that through your word you might work and draw them to a saving and rejoicing knowledge of Jesus Christ the Savior. We thank you for his blood that cleanses us from all our sin. Let's sing that last stanza again before we close the service. There is a place that Jesus is preparing. There is a place where sin will be no more. There is a place of promise we'll be sharing. That place is heaven eternity's fair shore. Look unto him whose power can cleanse and save your soul. Look unto him whose blood can set you free. Look unto him whose sacrifice can make you whole. Then you will know Lord bless you and have a wonderful rest of your Lord's day. We do have an offering plate in the back as we always do whenever we take the Lord's table to, uh, to give to the needs of our community. And if the Lord should lead you to give to the Benevolent Fund, uh, you may do so there. Thank you. You're dismissed.